Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 183 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for another interview episode where we track down the best and brightest minds in the spirits and cocktail world so that we can share their secrets with you. This time around, we hang out with Souther Teague. He's a chef-turned-bartender who took the New York cocktail scene by storm with his tiny bar, Amor y Amargo, that placed bitters and Amari in the spotlight. Now, like many of us, he's hard at work reimagining his concept and reconfiguring his space in order to weather the pandemic. But before we dive in here with our friend Souther, I do have a quick announcement in the form of a new product launch. That's right, we're now partnering with Small Batch Cocktail Garnish Co. to bring you three different dehydrated citrus wheels. If you visit modernbarcart.com, you'll see their convenient three ounce bags of lemon, lime, and orange wheels that'll help you impress your friends and family when it's time to break out the summer drinks this year. And when I say three ounces, that's a surprising number of citrus wheels. Over 30 wheels for lemon and orange and over 40 wheels for lime. This means you don't need to purchase a dehydrator or spend all day monitoring your oven at low temp if you want to take your garnish game to the next level. To celebrate this trio of new products, we're offering 10% off your citrus wheels and anything else you order through March 30th, 2021 if you enter the discount code WHEEL at checkout. That's W-H-E-E-L. So be sure to take advantage of this fun little flash sale while you can. Getting back to all things boozy and bitter, you know what? Let's give you the chance to make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is an Amoria Margo original called the Sharpie Mustache. It was designed by bartender Chris Elford and featured prominently in Souther's book, I'm Just Here for the Drinks. To make it, you'll need two dashes of Bitterman's Elamakule Tiki Bitters, or perhaps a dropper of our Embitterment Typhoon Tiki Bitters, if you've got those lying around, three quarters of an ounce of Amaro Maletti, three quarters of an ounce of Banal Gentian Keen, three quarters of an ounce London Dry Gin, something like Beef Eater, and three quarters of an ounce of 100 proof rye whiskey, like Rittenhouse. Combine these ingredients in a mixing beaker with ice, stir until everything is well chilled and diluted, and serve up in a stemmed cocktail glass, or, like Souther does, in a 100 ml glass flask. To me, this drink embodies the DNA of the beverage program at Amoria Margo. It's boozy, bitter, and balanced despite itself. What do I mean by that last part? Well. Rarely do you see cocktails with a split base of aged and unaged spirits, let alone a split base of spicy rye and juniper forward gin. And rarely do you see a cocktail with more than four ingredients without one of those ingredients being some sort of acid. So what allows the Sharpie mustache to somehow buck these conventions and remain a perennial favorite at Souther's Bar? Simple answer, love and bitters. This cocktail was tenderly and kindly formatted as an equal parts drink, partially so we could memorize how to make it, and partially to give us a mathematical reason to have confidence in its balance. And the combination of flavors and botanicals in the Maletti, Banal, and Tiki bitters work like the stones in a moon bridge to span the flavor chasm between gin and rye whiskey. On paper, the Sharpie mustache is a bit of a head scratcher, but in the glass, or as it may be, in the flask, it's another story altogether, which is a theme you'll see play out multiple times during my conversation with Souther. So, now that you've got yourself a taste of Amoria Margo, let's turn our attention back to the interview. Some of the topics covered in this wide-ranging conversation include the origin story of Souther Teague, from a biker bar in Panama City, Florida, to the New England Culinary Institute, to tending bar in New York City. Why Amoria Margo is a bumblebee, and how it transformed from a trendy pop-up to an acclaimed East Village destination. 
the bizarre seductive energy that characterized a pre-pandemic visit to Souther's Bar and what it can teach us about the meaning of being together and sharing a drink. How Souther has become the reluctant master of the pivot and what changes are in store for guests at his new concept, Reserve by Amori Amargo. Some thoughts on the daunting task of pairing food with boozy, stirred cocktails. My first Underberg Bitter drinking contest. You'll never guess who won. Details about what's on the horizon for Souther, including several trash bags of bottle caps and a new Sunday dinner ritual, and much, much more. I've been listening to Souther since around the time he joined the Speakeasy podcast on the Heritage Radio Network, and it was a real treat to have an hour-long chat with him live, if not in person. I hope you'll make him and his co-hosts part of your weekly podcast diet. I hope you'll pick up a copy of one of his awesome books, which we'll link to on the show notes page, and at the very least, take a moment to say hi at Creative Drunk on all platforms. With that, I'm thrilled to present this candid and aerodynamically sound conversation with Souther Teague. Souther, welcome to the podcast. Hey man, thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, so why don't we uh, start by introducing you to our listeners by just kind of giving us the rundown. Who are you? Where have you been? Um, you know, what are you up to these days? Uh, well, my name is Souther Teague. Um, I own a bar in East Village of New York City called Amor y Amargo. We'll actually be turning 10 years old later this month, uh, but we kind of missed our entire last year. Um, we closed uh, on the 15th due to the pandemic. Uh, the city shut down on the 16th. We pulled the plug a day early, and our birthday is March 21st. Mm -hmm. So we didn't get to really celebrate number nine. We're hopeful to get to celebrate number 10. Uh, I wrote a couple of books. Uh, one's called I'm Just Here for the Drinks. Um, and one's called Let's Get Blitz in. It's more of a holiday cocktail manual. Uh, and I have my own podcast. It's called The Speakeasy on Heritage Radio Network, where the, the show itself is also 10 years old. Mm -hmm. actually, actually, 11. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, that's kind of who I am. You want, you want to go back to who I was? <laughs> Yeah, well, you have you have an interesting background in that you've sort of this is this is your second life as as the barman behind Amoria Margo. So yeah, take us take us back all the way to to when you started. I guess maybe maybe working in a bar. Um, well, I was a chef for twelve years. Uh, went to culinary school and all that rigmarole. Uh, traveled the country, cooking in lots of cities, um, and then moved to New York, sight unseen. I had never been here. <clears throat> I rented an apartment over the phone. 20 is 20 years ago. Um, didn't have, you know, so much internet going on. Uh, and I came to the city thinking that I would get myself a job as a waiter. Um, even though, I, you know, I was a pretty accomplished chef at that point, but I thought I can get a job as a waiter, make some fast cash, learn the city, probably move out of the apartment that I rented because it's probably in the wrong neighborhood. It absolutely was. Um, I, I rented it. I got a six month lease out of the woman. So, um, and I literally sat down with an MTA foldable map and a Zagat guide and looked for restaurants all over the city that I was going to go apply at. And then the next day I got on the train and went to the furthest one away and thought I would apply my way home because either way I got to come home. Right. Mm -hmm. And of course the very furthest one away, <laughs> the first place I went to, um, the mater D there who took my resume was a guy named Alex Cochon and he uh, used to live in New Orleans and worked for um, Susan Spicer and Donald Blink at Herb Saint. Well, I had worked for Susan Spicer myself, so he knew my name. My name's pretty unusual, Souther, right? We'd never actually met. Uh, and he leans over the host stand or whatever, and he just kind of looks at me and goes, you, you don't want to cook here, do you? Because it wasn't kind of the same level as we were on at, at, at uh, um, Bayona and Herb Saint. I said, no, I'm just looking for a gig on the floor. I'll, I'll do it for six months. I don't want to, you know, screw you out of, you know, wasting your time on uh, training me and all that sort of thing. And I'll, I'll come back and, and, and I mean, I'll stay with it for at least six months, but then I'm going to look for a job as a chef and get back in my career. And he says, well, can you bartend? And I said, I've been making delicious food and putting it on a plate my entire career. I don't know why I couldn't make a delicious drink and put it in a glass. And that's how it started. Uh, I, I, again, I committed to six months. Uh, at that bar, I stood there for three years, uh, and then I moved from bar to bar. I, at that time, I, I I started moving to bars that were chef driven. I worked for um, Gray Coons at Cafe Gray's, 
Um, I work for John Frazier at Dovetail, um, you know, where we got three stars from, from the New York Times. Um, and then I started moving into more crafty cocktail bars and a few dives as well, you know, just a place to sling drinks. And got, I got a lot of, you know, a lot of different and varied experience being here in New York City, um, but I, I never had any urge to go back into the kitchen. Mm. And and did you grow up on a near the beach doing bar <laughs> stuff there as well? <laughs> sort of. Uh, I did grow up on a beach, yes, Panama City Beach, Florida, what's known as uh, the Redneck Riviera. It's also colloquially known as L.A., Lower Alabama. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a nightmare. I, uh, I left there. Uh, just four days after I graduated high school and I've never, ever returned. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. I hated it, but my dad owned a bar. Um, it was called the anchor bar. It was situated right on the sand. Um, it was uh, largely a um, motorcycle bar. My dad was a Harley Davidson enthusiast, a biker. So lots of bikes in the parking lot, uh, lots of fights in, in, in over the pool table. Uh, and, and at that place as a kid, I would carry uh, whatever, you know, cases of Miller High Life from the walk-in cooler out to the bar for my dad, and he'd give me quarters, and I'd plug them into the Pac-Man and Centipede game that we had standing there, stand-up machines, <laughs> asteroids. Yeah. Nice. Different times. Yeah. So you've you've certainly had a, a lot of variety in your journey, and I, I think that that suits a bartender well, especially... Uh, doing the things that that you've done with Amoria Margo. So I'd, I'd love to bring our listeners up to the point in your story where you decide to open this admittedly strange little bar. And and the, the way that I phrased the question in, in what I sent you was, um, you know, how did you open Amoria Margo and, and why is it a bumblebee? So maybe, maybe take that and run with it. Sure. And it is. Uh, we'll get to that uh, in a sec. But it is a bumblebee. Um, how did I open it? You know, uh, people always say, like, how'd you get so into enter whatever it is you're into, right? Uh, and the, and they want some kind of romantic uh, or at least romanticized story, you know? How did you get so into Amaro? Uh, you know, they want they want me to say, well, I was, I was walking down the streets of Italy and I was hit by a Amaro truck. And from then on, I loved it forever. That's just not how it happens. Uh, as with everything, um, things happen... In, in, Everything happens in the same way, and that way is it happens slowly at first and then really quickly, <laughs> right? So um, when I first got behind that bar, uh, that was it. It was a place called the Atlantic Grill. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, when I first got behind that bar, uh, it was an explosion, right? I'm, I'm looking everywhere. I'm looking at everything. I'm trying anything I can try. I'm digging up books. I'm looking, uh, uh, you know, that's the beginning of the internet. I'm looking at for, for blogs and things like that gathering as much information as I can, just like I did when I was a chef, trying to recreate things and eventually begin to see where my focus lay. Yeah. So in the beginning, I'm doing everything, you know, I'm trying to make pina coladas and uh, back then, you know, things like the woo woos and, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and you know, whatever. Uh, and so, but as time goes on, uh, as a chef, as a, as a bartender, as a, I'm sure painter or woodworker, you start to hone in on the thing that you enjoy the most, and that's where craft begins, right? When when you repeat something over and over, that's what craft is. Innovation is a different thing, and art is certainly, I think, out of bounds for what we do. It's craft. Um, so I just started noticing that the drinks that I personally prefer to both make and to drink were ones that were stronger, spirit forward, stirred, not shaken, no juice, not a lot of sugar, if any. And what is this bottle of bitters over here? Oh, there are other bitters? wait, there are bitters that you can drink. Like it slowly sort of evolved into its thing. And then I'm realizing that the drinks that I drink are Manhattans and Negronis. And I like an old fashioned and like different bitters. I can make different old fashions. And then we get to the place where we say, wow, there's enough of this to maybe support an entire program. Uh, and there's enough of an interest. Um, so we started Amori Margo. Um, that was, again, like I said, 10 years ago this month, um, March 21st, 2011. But we did it with a sort of safety net. We planned it as a pop-up. Um, we were going to do it for six months. The room that we're in is 240 square feet. It's literally the former dry storage of the bar that we were behind. Um, it has its own entrance, but that entrance door was a metal door when we took it over. It was like a delivery door. Uh, we put in a window. We built the bar. Of course, we put in a bathroom. Um, and after six months passed, uh, my now partner, Ravi, said, 
oh, this did pretty well. Do you want to go another three months? And so at that point, there was four of us in the beginning. At that point, one of us had to fade away because, again, this was a pop-up. We all had full-time jobs other than this. Uh, and so then we went to nine months and Robbie said, you want to do this again? And at that point, the, the two of the others, so now we're down to just me had to fade away. So I had hired some other people, of course, and then we get to a full year and Robbie says, well, you want to keep going another three months? And I said, look, man, I've been working my full-time job and this for a year now, either we continue on or we scrap it. And he, I guess in the end, thankfully said, let's keep going. So I quit my job where I was the head bartender, um, at another bar in Williamsburg, Brooklyn called Rye. Um, mm -hmm. And which was notable in its own ways. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and we um, have been marching on ever since. Uh, the bumblebee aspect of it is that uh, it's it, it it's not aerodynamically sound, but somehow it flies, right? We we look at this project and we say, if I were to come to you today, Eric, and say <clears throat> you were interested in investing in a bar, and I've got a pitch for you, and Amori Margot doesn't, nor has it ever existed. I would say something to you along the lines of, I've picked a space that's frankly too small. Um, I'm going to slap it together. We, by the way, we, we built and, and put together the bar in three weeks and it cost us $7,000. <laughs> we weren't spending a lot of money because we didn't expect, like if we got through six months and got our seven grand back, we were going to be like, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm going to you know, kind of slap it together. It's got a low ceiling, uh, poor lighting. Um, I can only play background vocalist jazz music on a single speaker sound system because that's the deal I made with my neighbor upstairs. Uh, I'm not even going to have seats, and I'm going to line the bar with items that no one's ever heard of or tasted before. Uh, you want to invest in this project? <laughs> yeah, totally. I'd sign me up, right? Yeah, right. No, this sounds like a, a fool's venture. Uh, it sounds very ego. It sounds very... Um, you know, sort of self-masturbatory. It sounds like it's just something I want to do because I want to do it. And in fact, it kind of was in the beginning. We even referred to it as our own clubhouse. Uh, and it was uh, it was slightly annoying that people kept coming into our clubhouse. Like we were kind of doing it for ourselves. We closed at 11 o'clock at night because, again, the nights you worked at Amore was your night off from your real job. Right. So we closed at 11 because we wanted to have a night off. Um, but people kept coming. And when they left, they kept leaving money. Um, so then we started to realize, Hey, maybe we have something here. We didn't realize that we had. Yeah. It, it's interesting how, what we might call quote unquote proof of concept arises. Um, you know, sometimes, some, sometimes when, when you look at a business plan, it, it's easy to, uh, to assume that proof of concept will come and then it doesn't end up happening. And then sometimes when you do something that may seem more like a lark or that may seem, more like uh, just a temporary thing to just have fun. You know, proof of concept ends up sneaking up behind you and, you know, putting a bag over your head and throwing you in a van. And it seems like the latter is is what happened with Amoria Margo. I was lucky enough to be able to grab a couple drinks at your bar. I think it was June or July 2019. I was there with uh, my friend Charlie Birkinshaw, who makes Element Shrub. Uh, we were at a fancy foods convention at the Javits Center. And so we said, I was like, listen, if there's one place I'm just trying to hit while we're here, you know, I've been listening to this podcast, the Speakeasy, Southern Teague. He's got this bar, Moria Margo. He actually still works behind the bar. And so I want to I want to go here and, and see what the deal is, because, uh, you know, it was it was very even here in D.C., you know, when people talk about, oh, I just went up to New York. Oh, what bars did you go to? kept hearing Amori Amargo. And, and so I wanted to see what it was like. And my experience was, you know, that the energy in Amori Amargo was one of the key reasons why it was so exciting to be there, right? There's this we there's a, there's a weird sort of intimacy, but I think what that resulted in was that you go there maybe with one other person and then you end up being fairly close to another another set of people who are also excited to be there and you kind of end up all experiencing this shared vibration that you didn't know that you were going to experience when you walked in there. And so it was both a very intimate experience because of how small the setting was, but it was still a very communal experience uh, at the same time, it was it was bizarre in that way, but really exciting to me. So for what it's worth, that was my experience, and, and you made us great drinks. Um, well, I'm happy to hear that I, I pulled through on the drinks. This is not an <laughs> uncommon um, experience at Amori Margo, and uh, for me uh, to be there uh, and my team whenever they're there, 
we see it literally daily. Um, and it's, it's tremendously unusual. But this scenario that I'm about to describe happens with so much frequency that we, we've come to just rely on it. Um, and now here we are with this huge, uh, you know, global pandemic that's going to, that's going to change this. And it's sad to me, but, uh, on any given night at Amori Margo, it is shoulder to shoulder because the room is so small. Once we were described, uh, um, by the, by some press as, uh, he said, the bartenders look like they're serving drinks on the L train at 8 a.m. on a Monday, <laughs> right? It's tight. It's really tight. Um, but we wiggle through the room and we, we, we share the, you know, we, we share the drinks, serve the drinks. Um, we come out from behind the bar. You don't have to fight to get to us. We, we circle around the room all the time. Um, but what happens is two people will be standing there shoulder to shoulder with their drinks tied up in their, you know, in their chest and chatting with one another. And two new people will arrive and they'll have menus tied up to them because it's, it's so tight. Uh, and those two people will be speaking to one another and say, I think I'm going to try the A tomorrow Sazerac. And one of the two people who's already there with a drink will go, that's what I'm having. It's delicious. Would you like to try it? <laughs> and that is an unusual thing, I think, in any bar. But a bar in the East Village of New York City where complete and total strangers will interact immediately and be willing to share their drink with someone. Uh, the fact that it happens as often as it happens is it's still mind blowing, but we're, we're, we're weirdly used to this thing that is mind blowing <laughs> because it happens daily. Yeah. And I, I think what you just described is almost the second definition of communal, almost verging on communion. Like, you know, what sure. you just described is almost like somebody saying, you know, <laughs> the, the blood of Christ, like, like, here you go. Like, like you, this, this uncommonly tender act that you, that is, that is communal because it's not expected, but it's also so welcome. Um, yeah. And certainly we, we're not living in a world where that's going to return anytime soon, but right. I, I, I think it does, it does raise a Moria Margo as a really special example of what a third place could be. And I know that you've had some conversations on uh, the speakeasy about the importance of third places or third spaces and uh, you know, how, how we're losing those and, and you know, how that's been affecting people in, in a kind of a troubling ways. So um, you know, maybe, maybe at some point we can talk about, you know, how, how we can resurrect the third place and, and maybe do a better job with that. But um, uh, I guess, do you want to talk a little bit about how you've pivoted Amoria Margo since then? I mean, you recently said on the speakeasy that you don't pivot anymore. You pirouette. Um, you, you're down from a number of bars that you had launched uh, following the, the success of Amoria Margo uh, to, you know, a single concept. And so I'm, I'm wondering if, if you might speak a little bit about those pivots and, and what you've done to, you know, keep a presence for Amoria Margo in New York. Wow. Yeah. The, the, the pivot is real. The pirouette. We're just spinning. We're spinning, spinning, spinning at this point, or at least I personally am. And the bar. It's a it's been a, a very tumultuous year and it still seems shocking and painful to say that it's been a year. But here we are. You know, it's literally almost exactly a year right now. Um, what we did at the bar. Uh, so it's difficult to explain if you've not been there and you can't see my hands. So I try, I try to not talk with my hands when I'm on the podcast because it makes me be more clear with, with my words. But if you've ever been to Amori Margo, it's tiny, 240 square feet. And you might've noticed that we duck through these double doors with the, with our glass racks. Uh, we duck into a kitchen that doesn't belong to us, uh, but they've got a dishwasher and they, we run our dishes through their machine. That kitchen of course is attached to the bar that's out front on 95 Avenue A. In this sort of weird scenario, what I'm describing is Amoria Margo was the roommate in the house that took the room that no one wanted, right? Um, but in what happened with COVID is that bar out front, which was called Mother of Pearl, Mother of Pearl did not survive COVID. So now the roommate in the room that no one wanted uh, and the owner of the house has moved on. So our choice here is to either move on as well. You know, we got to get out of there because we, we, we just rent the back room. We don't rent the whole house. Or take over the whole house, uh, which is what we ultimately decided to do. But we had to conceptualize it very quickly. Um, Amori Margo, even as small as it is, has always sold retail items. We sell books, bitters, and barwares. So we took over the front space, which is, you know, more than four times the size of the original space that we have. Uh, and we cut it in half, or more actually. And the front half of it is now a retail outlet 
called General Store at Amori Amargo, which carries all the things I just listed plus more. Um, and when I say more, I just mean that with my limited shelf space at Amore, we would sell, you know, X number of brands of bitters, and then I would rotate them in and out based on what was on the menu. Um, now I have enough shelf space to just kind of carry them all, all the time. Um, more, we've now got branded barware through Cocktail Kingdom, which is who we carry most of our barware from. But, you know, we've got spoons, jiggers, shakers, glass, uh, mixing glasses, uh, and glassware. They're all etched with our logos. Um, so that's cool. Uh, now we sell some t-shirts, which we never sold before. So, you know, we've, we've expanded. Uh, and then by cutting the room in, in more than half, we made the bar a more manageable size or a size that I prefer, right? Which is obviously tiny. It's still much bigger than a more, but it's, it's, it's a manageable size. Uh, plus we've decided we're never going to allow more than 20 people in there at a time. Um, and we made it look like a Mori Margo sort of dressed up for a night out. And we call that room um, reserve at Amoria Margo. And reserve is a reserve seating situation that's prefix. It's uh, uh, several cocktails paired with uh, some snacks uh, because now we have a kitchen. Um, and uh, currently, currently nothing's open but the store. We've been open five days a week for since Christmas Eve. Um, we closed uh, outdoor service because it simply wasn't serving us. Uh, it was costing us more to open up and do it than we were taking in. Uh, <clears throat> and even though we could do 25% capacity indoors right now, we're holding off on that until we've decided we're going to target April 1st for reopening. Um, so currently those things are just sitting dormant. Um, but that's the new, new pivot for Amori Margos. Now we have three spaces where we used to have one, uh, all in the same building, all still connected by the kitchen. Um, the guest can enter into the store directly, uh, the, the there's a door inside the store that leads to a Mori Margo reserve. But again, it's when I say it's reserve seating, it's also what's known as block seating, meaning everyone comes at once, everyone leaves at once. It's like a show, right? So uh, if we know we got an eight, eight o'clock seating. Everyone sort of gathers in the store. And then we open the door and let everybody come in at the same time. Um, and everybody gets the same. It's a prefix. So it's like a, it, it is a little bit of a show. It's kind of infotainment. It's me talking about Amari and bitters and pairing it with food. And, um, and then it's, uh, you know, then we click those out clean and reset the room and do it again. And then we still have, of course, the original space in Mori Margo, but currently it has outdoor seating, um, which we will hold on to probably for at least two seasons, even though I kind of despise it. I wish we didn't have it at all um, because it takes away from what you, what the story that we just described, which is the intimacy and the energy of the room. But my fear is that, um, you know, the pandemic is going to make people be a little bit slow to go back to that. Um, I know that in New York will be quicker than maybe Des Moines, Iowa will be um, because we live on top of each other. We have to take the subway, et cetera. Um, but I still think it's going to be a slow uh, journey back to the place where people feel uh, ultimately comfortable being side by side in those close quarters. Sharing sharing drinks, I think, is going to be kind of a ways away. This thing that we this unusual thing that we got used to, I think, is gone again. Um, but that's what we've pirouetted around with the bar itself. Personally, I've done all manner of crazy things in the past year. I've done 42 Zoom style classes, tastings, trainings, whatever you want to call those. I made and sold a Fernet Branca cured salmon with the Branca Mentha whipped cream cheese, the hard start bagel setup. I had a puzzle made. It's a painting of me that Jill DeGroff did some years ago. I made it into a puzzle. I've been selling those. I've sold about 700 of those guys. Uh, I joined a Facebook group of over 10,000 people to promote and sell my books, which has been a boom for me. I really feel fortunate about that. Um, I don't know. I designed custom shoes <laughs> with Vans <laughs> that say I Heart Bitters on them. We did a limited run of those. Uh, and then, of course, I did all that while running an outdoor cafe that I never expected to own or operate uh, and building and creating General Store and Reserve. So like, it's been a, it's been a pretty tumultuous year for me. Yeah, that is, that's the definition of the pirouette. You know, the, the pirouette doesn't stop the pivot, the pivot, the implication of pivot is a, is a 90 degree or sub 90 degree turn. Uh, and uh, yeah. this seems to be a, a spinning top, uh, for good, for good reason. Um, I, my, my good friend and co-founder Ethan Hall has one of the puzzles. So we were having drinks the other night and messing around with that. So, um, uh, it's a tough one. Uh, I've been getting a lot of feedback. It's tough because it's a, a watercolor painting. So there's not any hard lines to look for when you're searching through your puzzle pieces. I personally, I don't, I don't 
fuck with puzzles. I, I'm colorblind. They just annoy me. Ah, that's, <laughs> yeah. So it must be a, a double nightmare for you then. Uh. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think I, I think I gave up on puzzles as a toddler, you know, like I was like, these aren't fun for me. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to talk a little bit more if, if you can about your approach to pairing spirits and cocktails with food, because that seems to be a, a, a huge point of convergence between your past life as, as a chef, um, you know, things that you, you sort of glossed over, uh, were the fact that you were a teacher at, I believe the new England culinary Institute, uh, in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And then also you were the research chef or some held some position with serious eats, right? Uh, research and technical chef for the show. Good eats, uh, Good with eats. Alton Sorry. Brown, uh, yeah, with, uh, with Alton Brown on the food network. Um, yeah, uh, uh, it does. The, this is sort of crushing my past and my present back together. It's like you, you can't escape the kitchen. You, you keep trying to get out. It keeps pulling you back in. But that's okay. So how we even came up with Reserve as a concept is uh, we inadvertently beta tested it uh, for 18 months. Um, at Amori Amargo, once a month, I would... Uh, um, and by the way, this was... Well, you got to remember that, that we just went through a year that didn't count. So this was now three years ago. Uh, coming up on four years ago that we did this beta testing that we didn't even know was beta testing. Um, it stopped, I remember very clearly, uh, in April um, four years ago because I got hit by a car uh, and I couldn't do it anymore. Um, and then I just never went back to it once I was better. Uh, but we would close the bar one Sunday a month and we would take 60, 60 reservations for that tiny room. Uh, we'd break it up into five seatings of 12. We clear everything off the bar, all those little bottles of bitters, the pewter, everything off the bar, and seat uh, 12 people and serve them three cocktails paired with three snacks. Now, the real uh, sort of selling point of that was that we would break away from our normal um, style of drinks uh, at Amori Margo for that one evening. So that was the that was the that what drew the public, you know. And when I say break away at Amore, we don't use any juice, we don't use any sugars or or, or uh, house made ingredients. Uh, everything's alcohol. It's the easiest way to describe it. The only thing non-alcoholic on the bar is water. I have flat, frozen, or bubbly. Um, but so in these nights, we would, uh, fuck a daiquiri, I'd shake a drink, you know, like, whoa, mind blowing. And people would like be excited to see us do those things in this room where they'd never had that. Um, but we were using the rotary evaporator. We were clarifying things. We were, you know, all the cutting edge techniques and, and stuff we were, we were getting into that we couldn't do based on the ethos and style of the bar. Plus, I'm uh, being a former chef. I would make snacks that paired well with these drinks, right? So Max would be uh, Max or, or Austin, one of my two bartenders back then. One of the two of them would be in the in the in the in the bar making drinks, and I would be zipping in and out of the kitchen with plates, um, cooking and serving and making jokes. Um, and it was wildly successful. Uh, we did it 18 18 months in a row, and never a single time did we not sell out and or oversell the room. So, uh, you know, when faced with this notion of either having to bail out of a Mori Margo, which, by the way, you know, the hard conversations are having to close your spaces. You know, we're, we're a very uh, passionate and driven group, you know, a bunch of creatives, a bunch of alphas in the bartending sphere. And, you know, I've had to watch a lot of my colleagues uh, and friends do the, the impossible um, or the improbable and survive all this mess. And I've had to watch several of them go down with the ship. And, and you know, I, I keep trying to convince them and anyone that I know that's maybe in a position where that might happen, that it's not worth it. There's nothing noble about going down with your ship. Um, you know, get yourself to a place where you're okay and you can maybe build a new ship. Um, so to that end, I closed four of my own bars instead of letting them take me down financially. And believe me, we, we scrutinized, even though the popularity and the longevity and um, the belovedness of Amori Margo. We, we, we considered closing it. You know, we were like, well, we can drop back 10 and punt. We'll, we'll reopen it somewhere else or we'll move on. Anyway, in that consideration time, when, when we had to look at the space, that was the idea that came to mind. I said, well, let's try and do what we used to call that program two weeks notice. I said, let's try and do two weeks notice every night. Now that's a, a much more Herculean effort to do it once a month was, you know, kind of fun and unique and you know we sold it out every single time can we do it every night uh energy wise uh and can we sell it out nightly so it's still risk uh a big risk uh, we're only planning to be open five nights a week um we're planning to do up to four services a night for up to 20 people a serving 
uh, a seating rather. Um, but we need to sell kind of kind of we need to sell it out <laughs> all the time for the first year um, because we've lost a year of income. Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot. Uh, we're gonna change the menu every two months, uh, both food and drink. And then I'm I'm taking the role as executive chef of this thing, whatever you want. I think that's too big a title, frankly. But I'm now both the food and beverage director. I'm the F and B. Um, I do have a, a couple of guys, just two, in the kitchen who will be doing you know my bidding, but I'll oversee all the food so that I can pair it to the drinks, uh, which is a huge challenge in its own right. Um, wine dinners, which are super common, even beer dinners, which are pretty common, are. I think much um, more forgiving uh, in pairing uh, than spiritus cocktails. And again, well, the cocktails that I use, we don't use any citrus or shrubs. So I don't have any acidity, um, which is one of the bridges that ties food and drink together. You know, beers and wines have acidity. Um, so we have to put acidic notions in the food itself so that it can be the, the bridge. You know, for instance, we did a coffee roasted carrots over an almond cream, and then we dotted the plate with what's called kokum. Kokum is a, kind of a raisiny textured dried fruit. Uh, it's in the mangosteen family, but it's really tart and bright. So you have this like coffee um, sweetness from the carrots, this creamy uh, almond notion going on, and then this bright little poppy kokum. Um, and we paired that with a, with a drink that had uh, akavit, you know, so a little bit of that kind of caraway, almost dill, matching up with those carrots, cutting through that coffee um, and those little pops of, of that, that citrus, you know. So we're it's a, it's a very thoughtful process and it takes time. And, and then, I, you know, just to throw one more curveball in there, my partner, Ravi, he's vegan. All his places are vegan. So uh, the kitchen's is vegan, um, you know, just to just to make it one more <laughs> hurdle for me to jump over. In in the spirit of the bumblebee, um, so yeah, yeah I, I I'd say if if nothing else, it's on brand. Uh, yeah, the the only the only time I've really encountered acidity in like a stirred boozy cocktail is when I find hibiscus. Hibiscus is like the one ingredient where if you find it in any sort of concentration, it can it can mime the acidity. And I don't know if that's because there's actual acid in there or if it because it does a, a, a hibiscus move that I'm not aware of. But uh, yeah, that's the only time I've really been able to in a stirred drink outside of, you know, actually using a citric acid uh, solution uh, achieve any, anything like that. So that's an interesting challenge. Uh, and it seems like, yeah, thought, thoughtfulness needs to be, you know, at the heart of every dish. You can't just throw something out there. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's not like we can just be like, well, there's some chips and olives like they do in Italy, and we're just going to serve you these boozy-ass drinks that are going to clobber all that food. We have to – it's a – it's a very thoughtful process, and and we're also um, because we only got to run it uh, with twenty five percent capacity. We got it finished, built. Um, the in New York City, we were allowed twenty five percent capacity. I think it was for nine weeks, maybe it was eleven. It was an odd number, but we didn't get finished building and open until there was seven weeks, and then they shut us down. So we only got to operate it for a few weeks um, as a trial run. And then we decided, like I said, not to come back until at least April, even though we could per we could be open at 35 percent right now. Um, just wasn't uh, wasn't pulling in enough to make it make sense for us. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things that I realized kind of right away was like, oh, my, I need to uh, employ a lot of techniques to create drinks that are considerably lower in ABV than the drinks I serve at Amore Margo. Right. Uh, because that high ABV is just crushing the food. So, you know, upping the amount of vermouth, upping dilution considerably in some of the drinks, um, you know, using lower ABV Amari, um, you know, uh, so it's like there's lots of lots of different uh, levers that you have to pull to, to, you know, tweak the concept so that it works. Sure. I'm thinking sherries. I'm thinking upside down formulations, stuff like that, right? Uh, yeah, indeed, upside downs for sure. We don't carry any sherry, but I have you know a, a crap ton of vermouth uh, yeah. and uh, fortified wines. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but yeah, th that's the exact thing. Um, and it's 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 certainly not impossible, um, and it, but it is certainly challenging. Um, yeah. But yeah. everyone that got to enjoy it uh, really enjoyed it. In fact, even in that short amount of time, we had several people coming back 
um, and several people. Uh, we we did uh, in in that short amount of time, we booked the room out to uh, uh, four different groups. Uh, we wanted the entire room. Um, so you know, it's again, as you said, the proof of concept seems to be there. Um, it doesn't have legs. Can it keep going? We'll find out. Yeah, we'll find out the hard way. The store is doing okay. It's open five days a week. We're selling um, all those things I mentioned. Uh, plus, uh, you know, because the restrictions being lifted in New York City, we're, we can operate as a liquor store, which doesn't help us uh, too much. Um, it's almost just an amenity to the guests. Like we can sell bottles of booze, and we're known for having all these Amari that you can't find maybe everywhere. So there's people coming and buying a few, um, but we can't purchase them in the same large amounts as any old liquor store. So we don't get the discount that they get. Yet we still need to charge the same price as them because we want to be competitive. Um, you know, no one's gonna uh, buy uh, something from us that's that's you know egregiously over the price that it is at Astor One Spirits, which is just around the corner. But uh, we also uh, have the ability to sell to-go cocktails. And so we made a, a line of six cocktails, three that are classics uh, and three that have been on the menu at Amori Margo for years and years and years. And we have these beautiful labels and we sell them in various sizes from 100 milliliters all the way up to a full liter because they're all spirits. They don't go bad. You can you know, drink them at your leisure. Um, and those are doing pretty well for us. And we know for a fact that the ability to sell bottles will go away. Um, we're told that if it's going to last for two years past the date of 100% occupancy in New York. Um, and it should go away, right? We shouldn't be trying to cut in on the, the profit margin of liquor stores. The same rules are set to be applied to bottle cocktails and to-go cocktails, but we feel pretty confident that that's going to last more than two years. It's going to go forever. And I keep bringing up Iowa um, as, the, as the example. Iowa was the, was the first state to say to-go cocktails are here forever. And if fucking Iowa did it, New York will do it, right? We're not going to let Iowa upstage us. Uh, and a couple other states have already come forward and done it too. So uh, I, we feel confident that that'll happen. And that is a good uh, margin getter, especially... Granted, my, my place doesn't do uh, to-go food or, or, you know, seamless or any of that junk. But if if you're a business that does do that, it's going to be, uh, a, it'll bring a, it'll bring some revenue into the house. Because if you love going to your favorite joint and getting their, whatever, their burger, and you love to sit there and drink their, that specific cocktail they serve there, uh, now you can get those, you know, delivered. So in, in the same package. So that that'll that'll generate sales for a lot of people. And we're happy that that's probably going to stay. Right. This episode is brought to you by Near Country Provisions. If you're like me, well, here are some things you might be like. You live in the Mid Atlantic. You enjoy meat. You highly prefer that your meat is sustainable and comes from ethically sourced animals. And you'd absolutely love for someone to deliver it to your door once a month. If this sounds like you, then you need Near Country Provisions in your life. Head over to nearcountry.com and check out their different, highly customizable meat delivery packages. And also browse their growing seafood selection. As a thank you for being a Modern Bar Cart listener, you can get two free pounds of ground beef or bacon included in your first order after subscribing if you enter the code BARCART. All one word at checkout. That's bar cart, all one word. Near Country Provisions is the real deal. And I can honestly say that I recommend them even if they weren't a sponsor. The meat and the local farmers they work with are just that good. Now, back to the show. Well, so I think the, the shift seems to be that when you open Amoria Margo, it... Uh, it wasn't necessarily as serious and the proof of concept was a surprise. And I, I think now things are almost flipped on their head and, and the brand that you've developed in the past decade has come to be viewed as very serious and, and very serious about executing in a very particular way. And uh, so I, I think where as you started this without much of a brand or without a concept that seemed like it made sense, now you are moving forward based largely on a reputation for, for doing great things. And, and does it does it suck to <laughs> have to do all this shit? Yeah, it absolutely does. But I, I think I think what people are seeing and, and, and why people are appreciating what you're doing is is because you're doing it in that same spirit that you have sort of developed that brand that you developed over these years. And so I think what what I and so many of your clients 
are appreciating about it is the fact that you're still being you. You're being you with a bunch of constraints that are really hard, but I think I and the rest of us are here because we like that. And we know that when you pivot or continue to pirouette, like we're probably going to like that too. Or at least we're willing to give you the benefit of the doubt until you prove us wrong. Yeah. I mean, that's, I appreciate that. And I, I do see that out there a lot, but you have to at least acknowledge both, both myself and you slash the guest has to at least acknowledge that there's a, there's a, a layer of unsustainability to that. You know, I, 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 if we go with the metaphor we're using as a literal, uh, I can only pirouette for so long. I will exhaust. Right. That's true. That's true. Um, so there's that. Uh, and we're kind of like strangely fearful that when is this going to end? I am exhausted. And the, the example that I've been using is, um, and I think, you know, uh, bringing, bringing the, the dark stuff in a little bit is good. We need to, we need to acknowledge that it's there. So I'm not too afraid to talk about this kind of thing, but I think that generally the public, doesn't understand what my sector has gone through during this pandemic. Um, the fact that we were kind of left out to dry um, by the government, uh, the fact that we were given these quote unquote lifelines with the parklets and the ability to sell bottles and the ability to sell to go cocktails. Um, the general public, I think, views it as like, we're doing okay. Like, you know, they see that but parklet outside of my place and they're like, that's three times the size of inside. And I'm like, yeah, but it takes literally five times the labor to pull it off. Uh, and People sit and stay longer, and they, you know, when they're inside, it's it's crowded, and they they stand there. There's no seats, and they they drink two and a half drinks. That's my average. That's just moving people through. We did over a million dollars in revenue in 240 square feet last year, um, but people we uh, and the room always has around 40 people in it. My outdoor looks much larger because it's so spread out, but it only holds 36. It's not always full. People don't drink uh, as much, uh, and and they stay longer, meaning they're holding the table. So the machine simply doesn't work. And again, it takes me more labor to, to pull it off because now we have to add food into the mix, uh, which we never did before. Um, so that means a cook and a dishwasher. And, you know, it used to be just one bartender, uh, but now it's someone inside and someone outside minimum. And there's two outside on the weekend. So, you know, we go from a model that ran with one or two people to a model that runs with four or five, depending on the day of the week. So the, you know, it just never caught up to itself. So, you know, there's a bit of uh, futility in there we, we we kept doing the outdoor service just really to show our loyal fans and maybe some new ones that we're still here we're still trying we want to be here um, we also made the decision on christmas eve when we pulled our team to pull it because you know it was cold out it was miserable no one was really happy doing it no one was really happy being there uh, we were all just kind of going through the motions and it wasn't making anybody any money the house or the team um, so we just kind of decided, well, now is the time to pull it. But also, <laughs> we were out of money. You know, um, I, I I remember pretty clearly uh, the first week of January saying to my accountant, um, hey, I need to order a few things to refill the cocktails that we are selling by the bottle. You know, because we just have two a double door uh, reach in fridge that's just full of these bottles because they're all shelf stable. We make, you know. We make them, they're just sitting there. So it's just like walking into your local bodega and picking up a seltzer water. They're just in there and they're beautiful. We got these great uh, labels made and they're gorgeous. But I said, hey, I need to order a few things to, you know, keep replenishing. I said, are we still on a spending freeze? And he said, Souther, we're not on a spending freeze. We're out of money. We're just floating. We're like a, you know, the horse wins, you know, when a, when a boat is, when a sailboat is is caught in a, in a, in a total lack of wind. You're, you're sitting there. It's pretty. You look, you look good. We built this new space. It's gorgeous. There's no wind, right? Mm. So, uh, and of course, we we persevered. Uh, we we got loans. Uh, we're still going to keep going. It's been a difficult time. You know, I'm, I'm super stoked to know that people are excited to see what it is we're going to do. But uh, the analogy that I was going to use is, you know, back in the Roman times, the champion fighter would be pampered and well fed and well rested, and the challenger would literally be marched sometimes a hundred miles to arrive right on time for the fight. <laughs> no food, no water, walking for 100 miles. That's where we are uh, in my business. We're still in that walk. We haven't even arrived at the fight, and we're exhausted already. So it's just something to bear in mind, you know, when we're when we're like excited for the things that people in my field are doing. Uh, we have to bear in mind that they're doing it on, on empty. Like we're all on empty. We're all on empty right now. Yeah. 
Uh, well, and, and being on empty together is, is a tough situation because it's, you know, if you're on empty, it makes it more difficult to support somebody else who's on yep. empty, you know, where uh, and I think bartenders, especially, uh, you know, I remember an interview you did with uh, Brian Vincent Weber on the Bartender Journey podcast where you talked about your brand of hospitality, eye contact, glass of water, um, I that that the first two things that people get when they walk into your bar is, is a friendly greeting and a glass of water. Uh, even if you're not in a position to actually serve them the thing that they're, that they're there to get, you, you at least give them those two things. And, uh, you know, sometimes when everyone's running on empty, it's difficult for us to even get there. And, and so that, and, and that to the type of person, like you were mentioning earlier, who, who wants to be a bartender, that, that type of personality who is a go-getter, who thrives on other people's energy, um, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to, to just be at that lack of energy and, and feel like you're not in a position to take care of people. And so, so I understand how that's difficult, not only for you, uh, but for your compatriots behind the bar as well. Um, and I know that one of the things that you kind of enjoy when, when, you're, when we're in the normal times is introducing people to stuff that they've never had before. And so I thought what might be fun for this interview would be to to have you do that for me. And and I, I went out to a liquor store and bought uh, the last, literal last bottle of Underberg bitters that they had. So I, if, if you're interested in, in sharing one with me or, or perhaps just walking me through this tasting, uh, I would love, I would love to, to do that with you. Hilarious to me that you got the last single bottle. Um, this, this was yesterday. I was going to wait until this morning, so I'm glad I went yesterday. I have a three-pack here. Uh, so what role does Underberg play in your uh, daily ritual? <laughs> uh, I get asked this a lot. Uh, I drink an Underberg at least one every single day. It is the first thing I drink right when I wake up. Um, I don't drink coffee, so this kind of gets me going. They come in so three, basically three-quarters of an ounce uh, bottles. I'm um, looking right now to, to remember uh, 44%. So it's, eight, it's uh, uh, 88 proof. It toes the line between a tincture and a potable bitter, meaning that though it is a tincture, it is meant to be drank all at once. But again, it's three quarters of an ounce. It's tiny. Sure. Um, it's not even, I don't even think it's even three quarters. It's 0.67 fluid ounces. So it's more, more like two thirds. Anyway, you crack off the top. First, you want to get a little aroma. I mean, oh, yeah. you're going to get a lot of, because it's such a tiny, you know, orifice to be able to smell through, you'll get a lot of anise off the nose at first, but mm -hmm. you'll get a lot of like sarsaparilla, oh yeah, men uh, menthol, uh, eucalyptus. Once you once you get into the tasting, it reminds now, me of like a little crystal hot sauce bottle. Uh, yeah, that's basically what it is. And then uh, there's a, a, several methods that you take to drink this thing. <laughs> It's usually a race. I've never done one over Zoom, by the way. This is hilarious. Uh, it's usually it's usually a race, uh, and I have never I've never lost. All right, you ready? Three, two, one, go. Uh, that. I see. So I noticed that you have a, you have a bit of a, a strategy there, which I wasn't aware of until I could hear you doing it through the headphones. Yeah. Um, you, you, you sort of bite the neck, uh, let go of it with your hand, tilt your head back and sort of puff on it like a cigar. <laughs> Which is, yeah, that's a, uh, wow. Okay. I'm glad that you choreographed that because I wasn't watching you. I was, I had my head back myself. So that is the, uh, the uh, tried and true Southern Teague method for consuming an Underberg bitters. It is bracing and refreshing, uh, bitter, but not too bitter, especially for somebody who makes bitters. Yeah, yeah I love it. it. It like charges your uh, salivary glands. You know, every time I have one, I get, you know, my mouth gets very wet. Um, you know, it's got a little almost a white pepper finish. Yeah. Um, again, like I said, eucalyptus, anise, uh, menthol, um, super herbaceous. They do make a, a, a potable. It's called Brasilberg. Um, you don't see it in the United States. It's not distributed here. Uh, if it comes in a full size, you know, liter bottle, um, that one has its own story. One of the grandsons or great grandsons of the of the family moved from Germany, where it's made, to um, Brazil. Uh, ostensibly, he was moving there to grow grapes to um, distill to be the base of Underberg and send it back home. But he missed his beloved Underberg so badly that he went out foraging and, and created close enough, uh, and so it's uh, available in. Brazil. I, I got a couple friends who I'm, I keep trying to, who, who import stuff. I keep trying to get them to import Brazil bird for me. 
they have yet to do it. However, every time they go down there, they bring me a couple bottles back. So I have some on the bar tomorrow. Uh, here's the unique thing about this stuff, though, or another unique thing. Um, the caps, you save the caps. Um, and they, uh, oh, here. When you look inside the box. Okay. Uh, which you don't have because you just got a single bottle. There's a little catalog of all these different things you can buy with the caps, including oh. a little Underberg truck, which if you use enough caps, you can get a custom license plate. And if you have even more caps, you can get the trailer, which is a music box. I have it right over here if you want to see it later. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> there's a Bandolero that holds 30 bottles of Underberg. I have two of those. Uh, I have everything from here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, the, the Bandolero sounds fantastic. Yeah, it's behind me somewhere. I'll, I'll pull it out and show it to you when we're done. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's their loyalty program. And then just an odd note about that. I literally have everything that I could ever want from them. Um, because I'm a avid fan and collector, but I also have a garbage bag nearly full of caps that I'm going to give away on my Instagram. <laughs> yeah, man, that's that's fantastic. Well, thank you for sharing all of that with me. It's an Underberg's always something that I've been aware of, but it's never been something that I've been like, you know, what I need to get at the liquor store today. Underberg, it's always been something else. So I'm glad this was a, a way for us to kind of tread into new territory for me and, and for our listeners to learn about the crazy incentives program. And it seems like this is just an aside. It seems like Brazil has a thing for people coming in and reformatting Amaro formulations. Uh, Cause I believe they have a different Fernet formulation down there as well. They do. The Fernet in Brazil is much drier uh, than, than the one we get here. The reason that it's drier is because the national drink of Brazil is the uh, Fernet com Coca, which is this Fernet Branca and Coca-Cola. Um, but Coca-Cola being as sweet as it is, they reformulated the Fernet itself to make, make it for a much drier drink. So oftentimes you'll see, uh, you know, or, or hang out with Brazilians here in America and they'll, they'll get a Fernet and Coke and they're like, this, this tastes so weird because it's way sweeter. Right. Um, one last thing I would say about Underberg, um, the reason that you drink the whole thing at once is it's supposed to help settle your stomach and it does bitters. We know does that for us. Um, their whole slogan and, and ad campaign is, um, uh, after a good meal, you, you're mm -hmm. supposed to. So they even make a little in, in the many things you can get. There's a little uh, plastic uh, two pack that'll hold two bottles in your pocket, nice and smooth. So you kind of always have them with you when you're traveling around. And I, I like that little, uh, almost like a little cigarette case, except it's uh, two two little two little uh, bullets that you can fire after dinner. Exactly. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I think that is a great transition uh, to the lightning round questions here. Um, th this has been this has been a really fun conversation, despite the uh, the weird circumstances that we're in. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad that you were here to uh, not only explain the normal times trajectory to our, our listeners, but also kind of walk us through the creative process uh, and, you know, sometimes just the necessary process of, of what it looks like to simply remain relevant and open during the pandemic. So thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, is there anything that, that we maybe glossed over that you want to add before uh, we, we jump into the lightning round? I would put this out there in your efforts, in your listeners efforts to support the restaurants and bars that they love. Don't forget that activism is a, is a way to support. And, and it's frankly, probably the more important one. I know you want to get to go and I know you want to visit your places as soon as you can and all that stuff. And, and that's certainly helpful. But what's more helpful is putting in place the safety net that we always thought was there, uh, but realized pretty quickly and as a whole didn't exist at all. So reach out to, you know, the Restaurant Workers Community Foundation, reach out to Thirst, uh, which is a, a, an organization that's helping restaurants, reach out to the Independent Restaurants Coalition and see how you can donate your time and or money to, to groups that are lobbying to change things so that we're better protected in the future from this, this sort of thing happening. Yeah. Yeah. And as, as somebody who's based in DC, I can tell you it doesn't happen here until it happens in a bunch of other places first. That's correct. So, um, well with that, let's jump into the lightning round. I don't know if this is a question that bartenders enjoy, but here it is anyway. What's your favorite cocktail? And if you don't have a favorite of all time, what's something that you've been obsessed with recently? I mean, yeah, no, we don't like that question. Uh, <laughs> it changes, you know. Uh, um, I drink like I eat, right? Which is to say four ways. I drink first to the season, right? 
uh, you know, if there's three feet of snow on the ground outside, I'm probably not going to have a mojito, right? Um, I drink second to the occasion. You know, I'm not a huge uh, drinker of champagne, but believe me, on New Year's Eve, I drink champagne. That's occasion. Uh, I drink to the atmosphere, right? There may be three feet of snow on the ground, but if I'm at Miss Favela's uh, uh, bar here in, in, in Brooklyn, uh, you know, dancing salsa, and they sell huge pitchers of mojitos, I'm probably going to have one, right? And then fourth, uh, every fucking day, right? So I drink to the season, to the occasion, to the atmosphere, and of course, every day. Yeah. Um... <laughs> uh, but to answer your question as best I can, I would say, I mean, I'm an old-fashioned guy. Uh, I drink lots of old fashions. And the reason that I would, would have to choose that as my, my favorite uh, would be because of its malleability. It, it can change based on all those things I just said. You know, uh, I can I can have a seasonal old fashioned. You know, I can have a I can make a gin old fashioned if it's blisteringly hot outside or to Blanco tequila one. Uh, if it's if it's cold out, I can switch back to whiskey or cognac or Armagnac, which I love. Um, you can malle they're malleable by flavor because I have, I personally have a collection of over 500 bitters, right? So I can, I can change the, the drink uh, forever. So the old fashioned is always going to be my sort of grounding cocktail. Yeah. I think it's the easiest cocktail to get correct in a loose sense of the word, uh, when you're starting out, but then w once you get a little bit deeper into the cocktail game it's it's actually one of the most flexible and like you said malleable cocktails and, and it's it's sort of if, if you choose to experiment with it uh you'll never be disappointed you may be disappointed with one of your experiments but you will never be disappointed with the project of experimenting with the old-fashioned because it's just an endless and always self-renewing process always sure. exciting you know even the disappointments are are will shine some light on some things you know mm -hmm. people i think are under the misconception that being a being a professional or an expert or you know a, a resource in any uh, category means that they do no wrong. Um, but understand that you know I I made plenty of bad cocktails in my career. I've tasted plenty of bad spirits and cocktails in my career. Those inform me to better make good cocktails and to better understand that spirits are good. <laughs> totally right. So you can't can't have you literally can't have the good without the bad. Yeah. Well, speaking of, um, you know, things that might be good or interesting, uh, are there any products or trends in the spirits and cocktail world or the bar world uh, that you feel are underrated or underappreciated at the moment? And I know it's a weird moment, so it's inherently a weird question. I mean, I think, uh, I think that RTDs, ready to drinks, are about to take off. Uh, I think we, we saw the, the couple of years of, you know, White Claw and Truly and all that stuff, which are just one and one, you know, uh, just some alcohol and some, some uh, flavor with, a, with some bubble. Um, I think that what, we're, what an underappreciated trend is going to be the uh, onset of well-made by reputable people cocktails that are ready to drink. For instance, Dante, which, uh, you know, this past year, well, year, this past year doesn't count. Year before was, uh, you know, number one on the 50 best bars in the world list. Uh, number one uh, at Tales of the Cocktail, like the best bar in the world for all intents and purposes, for whatever those sort of things mean. Mm -hmm. um, and now they're doing an RTD, right? And you bet your ass, it's delicious, right? Guys like Aaron Polsky who are out there making, a, making drinks called Livewire. They're delicious, right? We're getting to a place where we see that RTD is not, uh, you know, a bad word. We have the technology. Why can't we make these things delicious? So I think that that's that's the underappreciated thing. We're we, and I think it's simply just because we're not. I think we're we're, we're hesitant to be ready for it. We kind of just don't want to, right? I don't want it to be good because I'd rather sit down in front of a bartender and have him make me a drink. Well, someone sat down and made this drink, and then they canned it for you. I think maybe that's an under uh, an underappreciated thing, but I think it'll come around pretty quickly uh, now that we've gone through the pandemic uh, or still are now that we've seen that lots of bars are doing, you know, to go stuff we're we're, we're just more accepting of the of the notion. Um, and now that, you know, the technology is there, canning is pretty easy. You can get a canning machine for around a thousand dollars like it's not a huge deal. Yeah, I think that, that's it. 
Yeah, we judged uh, ready-to-drink cocktails as a category at the American Distilling Institute annual judging of craft spirits last year. And I I, um, I think the, you know, we, we were actually pretty pleased with uh, some of the products that were there. Certainly the still versions were, were pretty nice. Uh, but the one thing to keep in mind, uh, you know, if you have any friends who are getting into this, is that what we dinged scores on most was the lack of high quality bubbles, right? You know, why do you, why do you t take a Topo Chico over uh, a Poland spring sparkling water? Nothing against Poland spring, but if po Topo Chico is sitting right next to it, I want them bubbles because those yeah. bubbles are exciting. And so, you know, if you're going to give me a gin and tonic, that's going to be flat in two minutes. Uh, well, that's a gin and water with some bitterness in it that I didn't order. So uh, yeah, I think, I think once the, once the people can iterate with the, the sparkling ones to a point where they can actually maintain some of that, uh, some of the bubbles and maybe some of that has to do with vessel shape and storage and temperature at canning, like, the, the, you know, they'll get there and they'll get there rapidly. So I, I definitely agree with you on that. Big question here, cocktail with anyone past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? Just kind of paint us a little picture. I'm a big fan of Western history. <laughs> I think I would I would want to hang out with Wyatt Earp and his brothers in a saloon somewhere, probably in Arizona, you know, and drink. Uh, we would drink whiskey. That's what you drink at that time, mm -hmm. <laughs> and just uh, talk about an experience and see what it, what life was like at, at that time in America when 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 law and order were only just being sort of formed, when when life was still hard. But it, but it wasn't that long ago, you know, like uh, White Earp died, I think, in like 1930 something, 1940 something, not that long ago. Right. And, and he lived in a time where, you know, no electricity, you know, starting up a fire every morning to cook eggs that you went and got from your chicken that you probably killed later to eat for dinner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, that, that's a that's a fascinating time. Uh, I, I would want to go back to that, I think. Conversely, if I if I pick someone alive, I would want to talk to somebody like, honestly, a complete shift of gears, somebody like Michelle Obama, you know, uh, a strong female voice that's poised and graceful and sane, <laughs> you know, like uh, I feel like we've we've had such a tumultuous uh, couple years. Uh, I, it would be good to just sit with someone who has a, a clean grasp on the things that are going on around them and, and just uh, enjoy a conversation. And I guess with someone like her, I, I would imagine we would drink some, some champagne. Mm -hmm. A couple <laughs> things on that. Uh, m over two years ago, I, I decided I was, I was driving home and I had to record a podcast in my car of just me monologuing. And so I decided to answer the lightning round questions for the first time. And, and back then, uh, my, my answer was uh, Barack Obama, actually. So uh, interesting, interesting parallel there. And um, I love Western history as well. Um, one of my favorite pictures, you, you were mentioning like these, these people were strangely contemporary with us. They're not that far removed. They're like right. two and a half generations removed. And so I, I love to reference a, a picture of Mark Twain with a, a 1911 hand, uh, it was a semi-automatic handgun. And you see Mark Twain holding a handgun that looks like the service weapon that a modern police officer would wear and you're like whoa okay that puts it in context um well so to wrap up the lightning round here um just wanted to ask what is a unusual or controversial view that you hold in the spirits cocktail bar world i don't know that it's controversial anymore um but i think uh i definitely uh, got into some controversy some years ago uh with the notion that i i i put bitters in every cocktail um, even cocktails that are classics that maybe didn't ever ask for them. Um, the, the Negroni comes to mind the most, uh, because I have uh, these custom signs that I had made that hang in the space at Amori Margo. And now I had them remade to hang in the Amori Margo reserve. I also had them made to hang in Amori Margo too, when we had that space because they define what we do. Uh, and they are just, uh, these, uh, sort of graphic art pieces that show an old fashioned, a Manhattan and a Negroni and then say what they are in their base terms without using any brand identification. So the Negroni says, uh, spirit, vermouth, amaro, bitters. And I would get a lot of flack from, for that from, from the bar world because they're like, well, the Campari is the bitters. And I'm like, I agree. But at Amori Amargo and any space that I have purview over, 
a Negroni is not a one to one to one cocktail. It's two to one to one. So the spirit gin is you know, one and a half ounces, whereas the Campari and Sweet Vermouth clock in at only three quarters of an ounce each. So I do that because the original Negroni was overwhelmingly likely made with overproof gin. And that gin was probably beef eater. And that's the gin that I use at Amori Margo. So uh, if one to one to one with overproof wouldn't necessarily be the one to one to one with not overproof, right? So we got to bring back the gin, the heat. So we double it up. But then that reduces some of the bitterness of the Campari and the vermouth. So then I bolster that by adding bitters, right? So it's not like I didn't think about it. I thought about it. But also to that point as well, I put bitters in my daiquiri. I put bitters in, you know, every drink. And it's pretty uh, straightforward to me. I think that, you know, it's like a daiquiri. I put, I'm going to put lime bitters in there, right? It's going to tie everything together. Uh, or maybe I'll put some kind of weird-ass bitters in there that, that seem unusual but, but work for me. But, you know, the, the analogy that I constantly use, again, as a former chef, cocktails are simply, you know, a soup and, and bitters are seasoning. I wouldn't eat unseasoned. I wouldn't serve unseasoned soup. I wouldn't eat unseasoned soup. Uh, why would I serve or, or drink an unseasoned cocktail? I was hoping you were going to bring up the cold soup before we wrap this up. So, so yeah, that was, I, if, if there was a, if there was a bingo board, you just, you just got me bingo, man. Uh, so, so yeah. Uh, so that this has been terrific. I really appreciate your time and, and the amount of, um, you know, just candor that you've uh, given us and, and uh, just your expertise and, and what you brought to the space. So thank you for being here. Uh, is there anything that you want to promote? Anything? Uh, I, I think at the very least you should promote your Sunday dinners on Instagram, man. That's awesome. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I just started them. There's only been one of them. Uh, I decided that I was going to make uh, dinner for myself on this past Sunday, as I've been doing throughout this whole <laughs> pandemic. And uh, I invited my Instagram following along with me. So I, I just uh, I put up a poll. I let them vote on two different items. Uh, it was carbonara or bolognese. Uh, carbonara won pretty handily and so uh, you know i try to keep it under 30 minutes uh, we just made pasta carbonara and uh, included a drink as well so since we we're making carbonara which had excess egg whites we, we made a sour using egg whites so i just walked people through that i'm gonna try and do it again this sunday uh, but either way you should check out my instagram facebook uh, twitter uh, clubhouse i'm creative drunk on all platforms tiktok uh, youtube channel i've got it all I haven't really done anything with TikTok yet, but uh, I, I started a YouTube channel as well, all under Creative Drunk. Um, I'm an open book. Uh, if you want to DM me questions, uh, I'll gladly answer them. I host AMA sessions pretty often um, uh, on Instagram, and I answer 100% of the questions I get to the 100% best of my ability. Um, and I've archived them all in that little strip below your you know, profile. So there's 15 of them. You can go back and look through 15 uh, um AMAs that all have about 100 questions each. So that's a shitload of questions. There's some repeats in there, of course. And then, you know, I'm in my, uh, in all my bios, there's links to purchase my books. So if you, you can purchase them directly from me and I'll personalize them for you. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and the puzzle, which I uh, told you I've sold a bunch of. I don't know. That's it. <laughs> And of course, every week on the Speakeasy through Heritage Radio Network, uh, it's part of my daily or rather weekly listening diet. So, uh, so I highly recommend that. And uh, yeah, if you can't find Souther through one of those venues, uh, you're unhelpable. And uh, we'll forget, forget you. But uh, again, seriously, thank you so much for your time. And uh, it was great having you on the show. Hey, man, thanks so much. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. 
can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear also definitely follow us on instagram and facebook at modern bar cart for cocktail porn recipes and entertaining tips and keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers which are happening all the time we love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects this episode may be over but for you the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning so remember folks drink responsibly and experiment boldly This episode was made possible with editing and sound design by Samantha Reed, Bitters and Bumblebee Insights, courtesy of Southern Teague, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2021.